With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. As we continue the closing section of the book of Hebrews, this 13th chapter that is filled with practical words of admonition, the writer tells us in verses 9 through 14 that the way of the cross of Christ is better because the Christ of that cross is better, higher, and greater than any other. But here in the ninth verse, we get a simple reminder that truth is better than error, Calvary is better than religion, and grace is better than work. Now, the Christian life is a life of grace. Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, By grace you have been saved through faith. 1 Corinthians 15 10, Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. 2 Corinthians 12, Jesus said, My grace is sufficient for you. Romans 3.24, we have been justified as a gift of His grace. Romans 5.2 says, stand firm in grace. And here the anonymous writer to the Hebrews says that it is a good thing for our hearts to be strengthened, listen, and encouraged, not by religious effort, not by personal merit, But our hearts are to be established and to stand firm in grace. Now this is a very important word of exhortation. And I want you to lean in close and listen carefully. One reason my heart has been so burdened and fixed on the truth of this text is because having recently celebrated my 21st anniversary as your pastor, 26 and a half years plus, on your church staff, I have seen more than an entire generation birthed into the life of this church, growing up in our preschool and children's ministry, student ministry, and many of them go off to college, technical school, some going right into the workforce, and that's just based on whatever God's call is on your life. And I have seen many drift away from the faith. It would rightly be called, in some cases, being backslidden. In other cases, it's nothing more than sheer apostasy. False professors who no longer believe what they once claimed to believe sitting under sound Sunday school teaching, and I pray sound Bible preaching, and yet one professor, one roommate, one friend, one young lady in a short skirt, one young man in tight blue jeans, and they do as the culture now describes, deconstruct. And the writer here gives a strong warning to stand firm, established in grace. The word here for being strengthened or established means to be rooted, to be grounded, to be fixed, fastened, and firm. For you see, for the young and the old alike, we live in a world where theology and ideology, philosophy, Changes like the ocean tides. What's in today is out tomorrow. What's out today will be in tomorrow. And the writer says, if you're going to live a life that is pleasing to God, you had better set your feet in the concrete of the grace of God. Now in this one verse, I want to show you three simple truths. First, what I will label a strong caution. Do not. Be carried away by varied and strange teachings. Some manuscripts give the verb tense that would indicate stop being carried away. And it could be that he's writing to some folks who are in the process of drifting away from sound doctrine and he says stop it and stand firm in grace. It could be that he's writing to those who are already firmly established in grace, and he is admonishing them to stay right there and to allow their hearts to stand firm in the grace of God. 
Now, the book of Hebrews is a letter of exhortation. That's how he describes it later in this 13th chapter. But it is punctuated with warning passages. The text before us today is not generally considered to be a warning passage, but yet it contains a strong caution nonetheless. Don't be carried away. Don't be carried around. I saw one Greek lexicon this week that I think was written by a southern theologian. It said this Greek word means to tote. (laughs) Don't be toted off. Don't be toted away by various strange doctrines. This word for carried away was used by Mark in Mark 6. 55, to describe the sick of the afflicted who were carried and toted, as it were, into the presence of the Lord Jesus in hopes of healing. In the same way that you could pick something up and carry it away or carry it off, the writer says that strange, various doctrines will pick you up, tote you off, and carry you away, and if you're not paying attention, you might not even notice. And the caution is very simple. If your doctrine isn't fixed and firm, it won't be long before you won't be fixed or firm either. This same root word is used by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4.14, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, here it is, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Wind, by its very nature, is shifting and changing. You can even go online and get a wind forecast. Wind changes like the weather because wind is part of the weather. And Paul says you need to stop being spiritually immature children, blown here and there, tossed to and fro, based on whatever the latest podcast episode you listen to based on the latest book that you've read or the latest TV show that you've watched. Paul admonishes young Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.13 to hold fast to the pattern of sound words. Notice this idea of holding fast to something that is fixed and established. Hold fast to the pattern of sound words you heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, put it this way. He said that theology has nothing new in it except that which is false. In other words, if it's new, it's too young to be biblical. May I say it again? If your doctrine is not firm, fixed, and planted, it will carry you away. Now, this is a word of strong caution for the American church that is so infatuated with the new, the bling, the bright, the shiny. Whatever is growing numerically must be right. And into that culture, I want to say as bluntly as I know how, that while I want my preaching to be fresh, I want my content to be ancient. While I hope when I come to the pulpit that there's evidence I've spent time with God in His Word. I want to preach with vitality and spiritual energy. But yet when it comes to the subject matter itself, I want it to be as old as Genesis 1-1. What one songwriter called truth unchanged from the dawn of time. Now there's some things it's good to have new. Truth isn't one of them. I mean, if you're going to buy a car or a truck, and if you can't afford a new one, man, take me for a ride in it. God bless you. If you can afford to buy a piece of property and build you a brand new house, have me over for supper. I want to rejoice with you. There's some things I like new. I like my clothes to be new. At Father's Day... When I told my wife that I wanted some new t-shirts and underclothes, I wanted them new. No goodwill draws for the preacher, amen? But when it comes to sound doctrine, grab hold of something that's really old. 
and doesn't change. Don't be carried away by varied and strange teachings. Now, as we just dissect this strong word of caution, let me mention a couple of things. First, a word about the number of these doctrines. He calls them varied doctrines. The King James calls them divers. It means diverse. It means that there are many. It's worth noting that the word doctrine or teaching, singular in the Bible, is used over 50 times. Sometimes it's negative, such as when Jesus rebuked the doctrine of the Pharisees. The singular word appears more than 50 times, and some of them are negative. But listen, the word doctrines or teachings, plural, that word is used five times in the Bible, and none of them are positive. There's only one source of sound doctrine, and Jesus taught doctrine. Repeatedly, the gospel writers say that the crowds were astonished by his doctrine. Now, the master taught on many subjects, but he only taught one doctrine. The word varied or divers gives us our English word variegated. Now, if you ever work in the yard or you work with plants, you know what variegated means. You know what it looks like. That leaf is not a single color. It's multicolored, multifaceted. It's a little bit of green, a little bit of yellow, maybe a little bit of white. Maybe that flower is a mixture of colors. And here the writer says, don't be carried away by multicolored, multifaceted, variegated doctrine. I call it hodgepodge heresy. It's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. By the way, for those who claim Christ as Savior, the most dangerous kind of doctrine to which you or I could be susceptible is false doctrine that labels itself as Christianity. (laughs) For then you don't have to renounce Christ, you just add some other stuff to it variegated (laughs) doctrine. It's the coexist bumper sticker on your neighbor's Volvo. It's humanistic Christianity. Woke Christianity. Liberal Christianity. Gay-affirming Christianity. Abortion-supporting Christianity. I could go on. It's foul-mouthed, beer-guzzling, sexually immoral Christianity that thinks it's still taking you to heaven because you prayed a prayer on Tuesday night of vacation Bible school in the third grade. It's what we might call chameleon Christianity. It just changes, adjusts, adjusts, and adapts to whatever situation you may find yourself in. This variegated Christianity is just as comfortable if you're shacked up with your boyfriend or your girlfriend as if you're living with your husband or your wife. This multicolored Christianity is as comfortable at a Sunday morning travel ball game as it is sitting in a Sunday school class before the Word of God. This multifaceted Christianity doesn't care what you believe about salvation or baptism or the person and work of the Holy Spirit the nature of Christ, alcohol, immorality, the church, gender roles, or these days whether there's even such a thing as gender. I'm talking about the number of these doctrines because, listen carefully, sound doctrine is not like that at all. Sound doctrine by its nature is narrow. It's specific, strict, and singular. Jude called it the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. In Proverbs 4, 2, the wise father says, I give to you sound doctrine, singular. And the Bible speaks of itself in 2 Timothy 3, 16, and declares it is profitable for doctrine. Whenever you have truth claims that are mutually exclusive, that is, they're different from each other, but they both claim to be true, listen, class, Both of them cannot be correct. They may both be wrong. 
but they can't both be right. Go to your math class at school, and if the problem says 2 plus 2 equals, there's only one answer that's right. And when it comes to doctrinal truth, there's only one answer that's right. And the warning here is about these various, numerous doctrines. The number of these doctrines. Note also a warning about the nature of these doctrines. The the text in verse 9 calls them strange doctrines or strange teachings. In other words, just about anything on TBN. Strange. I don't know if you remember when the COVID-19 pandemic first started, but TV evangelist Kenneth Copeland got on television and on the internet, and he blew and pronounced the COVID-19 virus out of existence. How'd that work out? Some years ago, there was a so-called revival down in Lakeland, Florida, led by a preacher named Rodney Howard Brown. It became known as the Laughing Revival. And people under the uh, power of the Holy Spirit would roll around in the floor as if they were drunk and they would laugh uncontrollably. I'd call that strange doctrine. Fifteen years ago, another so-called revival down in Lakeland, Florida, was led by a man named Todd Bentley. And in addition to claims that they had raised more than 30 people from the dead, which, by the way, could only be documented in their newsletter. I think if you've raised more than two dozen people from the dead, we're going to hear about it somewhere besides your website and your newsletter. Let the church say amen. Despite those claims of resurrections, he claimed that he could knock tumors off people's bodies by body slamming them, and in one infamous case kicking an elderly woman in the face with his combat boot. Strange doctrine. Preacher, why do you mention that? Because I distinctly remember members of our own church, now former members of our church, who were here Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, who got upset that we would not charter a bus or allow the use of the church vans to go down and be a part of this so-called revival. I'll tell you why we didn't participate in that. That's strange doctrine. And yet, none of that is the strange doctrine the writer has in mind. For this word strange, don't be carried away by varied strange doctrine. This word doesn't mean odd It doesn't mean weird, esoteric, or bizarre. This word strange is the Greek word xenos. It's the same root word that we found back in verse 2 of this chapter. Don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers. It means something that's foreign, something that's alien, something, hey listen church, something that's not from here. Now look right here, you need to catch this visual illustration. The strange doctrine that he warns us about is not from here. It may look good, it may sound good, it may be enticing and appealing, but when you measure your life by the boundaries and borders of the Word of God, that doctrine is not from here. It's alien, foreign. It's a strange doctrine. You turn on your Apple podcast or maybe so-called Christian radio, and you'll hear someone say that if you're a faithful Jesus follower, You'll have plenty of money in the bank. Hey, that's not from here. If you follow Jesus, you'll never be sick. That's not from here. If you follow Jesus, your business will go great. Your kids will always behave. Hey, you didn't get that from here. There's a new debate even this week raging in American evangelicalism about whether we should accept Roman Catholicism. Friend, people who pray to Mary, you say, well, they just believe the same thing we believe, just believe a little something different about Mary. Hey, you didn't get that from here. 
Some say water baptism washes away sin. You didn't get that from here. There's a growing movement in the American church that you can be a practicing homosexual and a devout Christian. I don't know where you got, you might have gotten that off MSNBC, but you didn't get that from here. The caution is, plant your feet, anchor your soul, tether your life to the faith that has been once for all delivered to the saints, and don't be toted away by various strange doctrines. The the strong caution. Note, secondly, a specific context. Because for all the warnings that we could give about false doctrines, we have to be mindful to keep this caution in its proper context. What's he talking about? What's he addressing? For example, if we were to have taken a group of our uh, youth, our middle schoolers and high schoolers, off to a revival, and let's say there were 400 people there and 387 of them got saved that night (laughs) through a manipulative, emotional invitation. And imagine I said, we need to have a conversation about sound doctrine. That statement would be made in a context. And you would rightly assume that I was addressing something that had been going on. So we'd do well to ask what was going on in the congregation to which this letter is written. What were the issues being addressed in the book of Hebrews? Now we could describe those in a lot of different ways, but let me just mention two items that I think are illustrative of the others. First of all, we find in the book of Hebrews that some had rejected God's Messiah. These were people who had been Hebrews. They had been practicing Jews. The strange and foreign teaching was that Jesus could not have been the Messiah. And this remains the theological position of the majority of the Jewish people today. And the writer says, if you have anyone tell you that Jesus is not the Son of God who came robed in human flesh, who lived in perfection who died on the cross as a substitute and was bodily raised from the dead, and listen, and that his death was sufficient to pay the penalty for all of your sin. If they don't believe that, that is a strange doctrine, and you didn't get that here. Because when you get your doctrine from here, going all the way back to the book of Genesis, you see that Jesus is God's Messiah. The seed of the woman who would come and crush the head of the serpent. In Genesis you find that he was Adam's covering, Noah's ark, Abraham's ram, and Jacob's ladder. When King David saw him, he said, the Lord is my shepherd. When Job saw him of old, he said, I know that my Redeemer lives. And in the end, he will stand upon the earth. When Isaiah saw him, he called him a wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. When John the Baptist saw him down by the Jordan, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Thomas called him my Lord and my God. And Simon Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Commentator John Phillips notes that this strange teaching these diverse doctrines. He says the reference here is primarily to Judaism. By its rejection of Christ, Judaism had become as foreign as any other wrong teaching. Now it's highly doubtful there are many people in this congregation today that are going to be enticed to become members of the Jewish religion by the end of the week. But there is still a very simple And powerful reminder for us, namely that it doesn't matter what a person or a religious movement gets right if they're wrong about Jesus. It doesn't matter if they have his name in their title, a cross on their building, a pulpit in their sanctuary. If they're wrong about Jesus, don't get toted off by those strange doctrines. 
A religion that doesn't believe Jesus was fully God and fully man, don't get toted off by that. People from the Kingdom Hall who want to tell you about a Jesus who was really the Archangel Michael, don't get toted off by that. A religion that believes that Jesus is one of many good ways to go to heaven, don't get carried away by those various and strange doctrines. Some had rejected God's Messiah. But some had obviously rejected God's mercy. That seems to be primarily what's in view here in Hebrews 13, 9. Look again at the text. Do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings. It is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace and not by foods. You see, when the writer wrote this letter, many of the professing believers were reverting back to Judaism. They were going back to their old dead religious ways. Still others were just intermixing and intermingling their old covenant beliefs with their new covenant profession. What they were saying is the same thing that the Judaizers of Galatia were saying. They were saying, yes, it's wonderful to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But that's just not enough. In Galatia, they said you need Jesus plus Ritual circumcision. Here in this congregation, apparently some were saying you need Jesus plus certain ritualistic foods, perhaps those that had been sacrificed on the altar in the temple. Perhaps it's a reference to the Old Testament dietary laws and Levitical restrictions. They were simply saying that faith in Jesus is not enough. And I don't mean to be unkind this morning, but but listen carefully. What I just described to you is the major religion of the American church. That the grace of Christ is not enough. That you've got to do something in and of yourself, empowered by your flesh and your own will, to add something to the finished work of the cross. They were rejecting the idea that you could be saved by the grace and mercy of God alone. Now we read in the balance of this book that these new Hebrew Christians were being criticized because Christianity, they said, couldn't be a legitimate religion. It didn't have a priest, didn't have an altar, didn't have a sacrifice, didn't have a temple. Never mind the fact that our faith does have a priest. And he's not just any priest, he's a high priest. And he's not just any high priest, he's a great high priest. He doesn't come from any other line, he's of the order of Melchizedek, which means our high priest Jesus will reign and rule and minister forever and forever. And we'll see in our next lesson, we do have an altar. It's not these steps, and it's not a stone edifice. Our altar is the altar called Calvary. And it is there that, yes, a sacrifice was made, but it wasn't a bull or a ram or a goat. It was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And as for having a temple, we've got a temple. We've got such a temple, we are a temple. By grace, through faith, we have become the very temple of the Holy Ghost of God. Commenting on the rejection of God's mercy, John MacArthur writes, I believe the primary appeal of this passage is for Jews who had heard and professed the gospel not to return to legalism. The new covenant, listen to this carefully, he's dead on. The new covenant in Jesus Christ has standards, very high standards, But they do not involve ceremonies, rituals, holy days, and formalities. They are internal, not external. You see, these Jewish believers of the first century were being criticized by their Jewish friends and family. You mean you've turned from all of these rituals and rules and regulations, and you've turned to this Galilean carpenter named Jesus? Why, you're not observing the holy days anymore. Hey, friend, through Jesus, every day is a holy day. 
You're not going to the holy places anymore. Hey, every day is a holy day, and every place is a holy place for the holified, justified people of God. We do have standards. There are commandments, but listen, friend, those commandments are not written on tablets of stone. By God's grace, they've been written upon our hearts. And we now serve Him, not with a have to, got to, must. We serve Him because we want to. Because our hearts have been transformed by the grace of God. So if one would be asking, what are you doing? I mean, what are you doing to earn the favor and approval of God? The answer is nothing. Y'all didn't hear me. What are you doing to earn the favor and approval of God? Nothing. His favor and approval, they are undeserved, unearned, and unmerited. You can't earn it by coming back to church on Sunday night. You can't deserve it by giving a tithe and an offering. You don't earn God's love by doing the do's and daunting the don'ts. That's how we express our love. Preacher, what are you doing to get God to love you? I can't do anything to get God to love me. But hallelujah, he did something to demonstrate his love for me. And that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. In a context where some were saying Jesus is not the way. And grace is not enough. It's in that specific context. The writer says, be careful that you don't get picked up, toted off and carried away by various foreign teachings. And with all of that in mind, I want to give you a couple of specific points of personal application. But we see not only a strong caution and a specific context, verse 9 reveals a spiritual comparison. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, here's the comparison, and not by foods, through which those who were so occupied were not benefited. Now the book of Hebrews is, among other things, a book of comparisons. One of the key words in the book, as you have already been taught, is the word better. In chapter 1, Jesus is better than the angels. In chapter 7, we have a better hope and a better covenant. Chapter 8, we have a better covenant with better promises. Chapter 9, we've got a better sacrifice in Jesus. Chapter 10, we've got a better possession. Chapter 11, a better country and a better resurrection. And in chapter 12, the blood of Jesus speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And even though the word better does not appear here in verse 9, it's obvious he's making a comparison and saying that we've got something that's better than the food which didn't even benefit the people who were so occupied with that Old Testament food. Two simple things and we're finished. I believe he teaches them, first of all, that the blood from God's Son is better. You see, the food that is referenced here is most likely food that had been offered on the altar of sacrifice. And the ancient priests were able to eat from that food. We'll pick up this in our next installment, but look ahead at verse 10. Here's here's part of the comparison and the contrast. You're, You're saying we don't have an altar, we don't have any food to strengthen us. Verse 10, we've got an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. You think that we're left out because we're no longer bringing blood sacrifices and are able to take from that meat and be strengthened by that food? He says, we've plugged into an altar from a skull-shaped mountain called Calvary. And our sins have been atoned for, not by the blood of bulls and goats, but by the blood of God's appointed sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. In many ways, one of the key verses of the book of Hebrews is chapter 9, verse 22. 
There the writer says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That verse ends with what may well be two of the saddest words in all the Bible. No forgiveness. No remission. No cleansing. But friend, that's without the shedding of blood. But I'm grateful that blood has been shed. The blood of Jesus is mentioned down in verse 12. We'll get there in our next lesson. That Jesus would sanctify the people through His own blood. It's still true today that without the blood, there is no forgiveness. So lean in close, pay attention to this. It doesn't matter how good you have been, how much right you have done. If your life is not under the blood of Christ, there is no forgiveness. But it doesn't matter, hallelujah, it, I say it doesn't matter how bad you have been. How far you've gone, how much wrong you've done. If your life is under the blood of Christ, there is redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our sin. And any time you hear a doctrine that says otherwise, run as far away from it as you can and don't be toted off by such a strange doctrine. He says the blood from God's Son is better. Secondly and finally, the blessing of God's salvation is better. It is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods through which those who were so occupied were not benefited. (laughs) There's a little sarcasm here. They're trying to get you Jewish Christians, Hebrew Christians, to go back to embrace an old system of sacrifices that didn't even benefit them. The reason is those sacrifices were never intended to be the benefit. They were intended to be the sign that pointed you to the fact that you couldn't get to God that way. All of those sacrifices and all of the commandments were never given by God for you to earn or merit your salvation. They were given so that you would recognize if that's the way I can't do it. If perfection is the way to God, if constant and full obedience is the way to God, then I'm undone. There's got to be a better way. And hallelujah for the cross, through the cross, there is a better way. And for those of us who come by the blood of the cross... We can eat from a table and we can drink from a fountain that's far beyond what old covenant adherents would ever understand. In the ancient system, the Old Testament priests would offer the sacrifices and then they'd be able to eat some of the meat from that sacrifice and they would be physically strengthened. The writer here says, We're not strengthened that way. We're strengthened by grace. Our strength to live the Christian life, here's the bottom line, is not found from what we bring and sacrifice to Jesus. We live the Christian life based on the sacrifice that Jesus came and made for us. And in that, we receive the greater blessing. Our strength comes from the sacrifice Jesus made for us, not the sacrifices we make for Him. I'll illustrate this with a story I've shared before. Sit very still and listen carefully. When my granny Stone passed away, she was a devout follower and lover of Jesus. 
But she attended a church that mingled works in with their salvation. When she passed away, a lady from that church cornered up my grandfather in the corner of the kitchen. I was sitting on the couch in the living room within clear earshot as she said to him, Sister Juanita has gone on to her reward. And if we've got any hope to ever see her again, we're going to have to strive and strive and strive and hope somehow in the end that it's been enough to get in. That wasn't the time for a theological correction. But sitting there on the couch in the living room, I began to hum under my breath. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one His wounds for me shall plead. And I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died. And that he died for me. One of the most addictive thoughts to the human mind is that you must do something to earn your salvation. And when those doctrines meet your ear and touch your heart, I admonish you along with this writer. Don't be carried away by that. Plant your feet and stand firm in the grace of God. You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, where Pastor Mike Stone is committed to walking you verse by verse through the books of the Bible. You can contact us through our church website at ebchurch.net or visit pastormikestone.com. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of the Emmanuel Pulpit.